Right. Well, it is a, a great pleasure of mine to welcome you all here tonight and to thank you all for coming along and supporting this event. The plan for the evening is to ask John to present his illustrated talk on the fix, who, where and when. We will then uh, give you the opportunity to, to ask John some questions. This will be followed by some refreshment, a cup to, cup to tea or coffee and some shortbread. And at that point, you can chat among yourselves or you can catch John and, and ask him any, any other questions you might have. Now, I first met John Borland last August in St. Bridget's Pictish Stone Museum, where he was talking to the Bredalman Historical Society about the Picts and the Stones. His passion for and knowledge of the subject was obvious to me, and I was delighted when later that day he agreed to come to the village to give this talk tonight. John worked as an archaeological surveyor for the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland and then Historic Environment Scotland for 36 years, retiring as measured survey manager in 2020. During his career, he has recorded Neolithic chamber cairns and up to World War II coastal defences and everything in between. I estimate that that must be about 9,000 years. <laughs> um, but he has always had a particular interest in what he calls Scotland's unparalleled assemblage of early medieval sculpture. It looks as if, even though he's retired, he can't stay away from his passion. For example, this week he was working his way through a batch of recently discovered Pictish stones dotted throughout Aberdeenshire, Murray and Caithness. In fact, I think he came down from a Inverness today to be with us. He told me that he was having lots of fun despite the wind, cold and rain that was tolerated a last Wednesday. Ladies and gents, I ask you to give a very warm St. Vigeon's welcome to John Borland. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, uh, thanks for asking me to come along and speak tonight. Thank you to Jim for organising it, and a special thank you to all of you for coming out on a cold March evening when you could have been staying at home watching the telly. So uh, it's tremendous to see such uh, uh, an amazing amount of local interest in your local heritage. As Jim said, uh, the talk tonight is called The Pigs Who We Are Ben. The aim of the talk is to give you a basic introduction to the subject, to the people, and uh, to the, the sculpture for which they are um, probably best known for. But in the, the course of this general introduction, we will swing past St. Vigeons the place and have a look at what makes it special uh, and have a look at the, the, the sculpture there. Um, I have a pointy stick in case, in case my um, laser pointer doesn't work very well, but it can also be used if there's any trouble in the cheap seats. So, just, uh, <laughs> bear that in mind. So, yes. Um, as, Jim has already said about me, um, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm not an historian, I'm not an art historian, so I make no claim to scholarliness whatsoever. And if at any point this evening you think I'm talking a complete and utter rubbish, you could be right. <laughs> um, my job is or was uh, as a, a surveyor of monuments, an archaeological surveyor, and my particular expertise was measured survey. That's probably not a term that means much to many people, um, but Basically what that is, is the production of scaled, metrically accurate uh, drawings, plans, elevations, sections. I, and my methodology was always working on site and um, recording the thing in front of me as, a, as an observer. So as Jim says, my, um, my, my work has actually spanned uh, from the Mesolithic, which is nine and a half thousand years ago. Um, uh, that's the earliest thing I've recorded was a Mesolithic shelving and um, plugged out, but I didn't put the picture up because, to be honest, there's no much to look at. It just looks like somebody dropped a flower ball from, a, from an aeroplane. Um, things kind of kick in and get interesting around the Neolithic, so that's about 2,500 
BC four and a half thousand years ago. Uh, so I worked on Neolithic monuments like this um, very splendid uh, and almost complete um, Neolithic chamber cairn. Um, that was great fun to work on. Uh, it was a wet, cold week, two weeks, but it was great fun. And then right the way up um, to a team being spent on the islands uh, of Orkney and the, the surround Scarp Flow, recording the huge number of wartime defence structures that are there. And this is a, um, a typical example. This is a shuttered concrete, a, a big naval um, gun emplacement that defended one of the entrances to the flow. And as Jim said, everything in between uh, hut circles, um, stone circles, dunes, brogs. Hill forts, all the prehistoric kind of stuff, and then right the way through our entire architectural history from uh, croft houses, country houses, tower houses, and castles, uh, cathedrals, uh, abbeys, and, and churches. Always have a particular interest in recording um, sculptured stone, and so again, I've worked from prehistoric cup and ring mark stones, uh, medieval, that's one of the um, Renaissance. Um, uh, Rounds from Fault of Palace there. Um, Post medieval, that's me working away um, at the upper level of uh, Craigie Bar Castle, recording some of the fabulous um, sort of mock water spouts there. <clears throat> but of course, my main interest, as Jim has said, is, is the early medieval, and particularly the Pictish. Scotland has a superb unparalleled collection. The British Isles are foremost in the whole of Europe for sculpture from this period, and Scotland is foremost within the British Isles. So um, this is a place to be if you're interested in working in this material. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight, to have a look at the, um, uh, the pits and, and get a, a kind of idea of who they were, and where they came from, and where they went. Um, I've also been president um, uh, and editor of the British Art Society for 10 and 11 years respectively. I stood down last October, passed back on to um, uh, my successor, uh, Professor Jane Geddes. Um, I thought it was time that the society had a rest from me and me from it. Um, but I'm still an active member and um, it's uh, very dear to my heart. So, who were the pets? Well, round about 400 AD, um, the Picts constitute one of the three native inhabitants of the country we now call Scotland. Um, their neighbours to the south were Britons, and their neighbours to the west were the Scots. The Britons uh, to the south were culturally and linguistically um, linked uh, to, uh, similar to the native inhabitants for the rest of Britain. So. Um, the language they spoke was Old Welsh, um, and so somebody from Strathclyde or Lothian or Galloway could probably have been largely understood if they had travelled right the way down to Kent. Um, they were all speakers of Old Welsh, um, uh, pretty much the, the length and breadth of Britain, south of the, the Fort of Clyde. The Scots, they occupied a, a Kingdom uh, roughly the equivalent to the modern county of Argyll, and it was called uh, Dalbiata. Um, and they were they had their origins, their cultural origins, and their political connections really with the northeast of Ireland, with what we would call Ulster now. Um, uh, so they were Gaels, and they spoke Gaelic. Now we don't really know for certain what language the Picts spoke. Um, uh, Adam Nunn, who was one of the um, uh, uh, sort of up in Savayona, um, he came about just less, just over 100 years after um, uh, Columba, and he wrote a biography of Columba, Vita Columbi, Come on, the Life of Columba. And he tells us that when Columba went forth on his missions into Pictland, he needed the services of uh, an interpreter. So we know that the Picts did not speak or understand Gaelic. Um, so uh, we know what they didn't speak, but we don't really know what they did. But it seems kind of obvious to me that they probably spoke a similar form of Old Welsh that was 
common throughout the length and breadth of the country. And we can see some evidence of that. Things like apple place names are common to the northeast of Scotland, the most Pickland, but also to Wales, where the Welsh language has survived. <coughs> So it seems very likely to me that um, they, they spoke a form. It would not have been exactly the same as their neighbours to the south, uh, uh, but, you know, it's that kind of um, uh, languages probably were regional, but largely understandable from one region to the next, with a gradual change developing up. But it, it, I think, probably had its origins uh, in Old Welsh. Uh, but anyway, what's in a name? By the early part of the second century, the Romans had colonised and taken control of southern Britannia, England and Wales, as we would call it now, and they had built um, Hadrian's Wall, which is this red line here. And by about the middle of the uh, second century, they had expanded north and had built the Antonine Wall. So Everything south of that was part of the Roman Empire and the inhabitants there uh, in were peaceable and <coughs> toned the line and behaving as the Romans would expect them to do, following the rules and the regulations. But even before either of these two boundaries were built, the Romans had already gone right up into the northeast of Scotland had built a whole chain of um, forts and camps, had engaged with the native tribes there, and um, uh, won a big victory um, uh, over them. Uh, but it was, it was kind of short-lived, and they never really managed to quell, so that's why they ended up retreating down south and, and with these two lines, these two barriers. And eventually they give up on the Antonine Wall and just go back um, to, to Hadrian's Wall because they just don't get any peace um, from the natives. So, but by the middle of the, um, the second century, they had circumnavigated Scotland and they had plotted all the different tribes that lived there and, and written down the names and the areas they come from. And if you can read your screen from there, you'll see there's nobody called the Pict. It's not a name that, that, that anybody was calling themselves in Scotland at that time. It just doesn't appear. The first record we have of the name comes in uh, near the end of the, the 3rd century, the year 297, when this chap called Eumenius, now he's actually a, he's, he's a Spaniard, but he's a Roman citizen, part of, part of the empire, and he's writing um, a panegyric. So that's a bit like a eulogy. It's where he's extolling the virtues of the emperor and the empire. A kind of Roman equivalent of Hos Legus, damn few the Rodid. Um, except the lovely Odid, because that is the problem. Uh, in, in this panegyric, he makes the first written reference that we have to the Picts, Latin picti, meaning painted people. And he paints a picture of them as being a little bit troublesome. They're not towing the line, they're um, giving a bit of grief. But first of all, he's probably not the person who's coined the term. This will have been a term that was used by the, the, the legionnaires on the, on the front line. Um, uh, and it's probably not referring to a tribal identity. It's still not something that the people north of Hadrian's Wall are calling themselves. It's a name that was given to them. Um, and I think you have to think that it's... Um, oh, oh, there we go. Um, it's a catch-all and it's a pejorative term for all these people who are given Rome grief. Um, and the best analogy I've heard was um, uh, Professor uh, Alex Wolfe from St Andrews Uni. Um, he, he, the analogy he made was think of the term redskins, that white settlers in America applied to all the Native Americans. None of them would have answered to, oh, you're a redskin, they would have looked over their shoulders saying, who? Um, you know, all the different peoples there, they all had their own cultural identity, their own tribal name, but the white folk there just referred to them all as red, red skins. It was a catch-all term and it wasn't a complimentary one, and I think that's probably what we're looking at with the name Pict. 
uh, is again, it's this catch all for all these folk out there who are just nothing but trouble. Um, the term means painted people, and we don't know whether that means they were tattooed or whether they daubed themselves with war paint. We can only hope that they didn't know what Mel Gibson, because that would be so <laughs> um, But, you know, lots of people are very vexed, and I, 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 you won't believe the number of heated arguments there are about this. And the thing is, it's just like, you know, pays your money, makes your choice, and um, we have no evidence um, of it. Um, there are archaeological um, sort of preserved mummified bodies, like from the steppes of Central Asia, where the bodies and the skin have survived and you can see these people were tattooed. We know that the Vikings for definite were tattooed because other folk wrote that down. When they sailed down um, the Russian rivers and into the Black Sea and into what's now Turkey and, and, and the, the Middle East, the scholars there, the Arabic scholars, wrote down that they had these paintings on their body. So we know that about them. Um, uh, but we just don't know. Well, the only thing we have is this one reference to painted, to painted people. So we just have to assume that it meant something. Um, either doping themselves with, with wood or tattooing their bodies. Because a lot of people like the idea of the Picts tattooing their symbols onto their body, and that's entirely possible, but it's entirely speculative. One little piece of very nice archaeological um, uh, sort of evidence that we have is this. This is a gaming tower. So this is the thing you would have put your dice into and then shook it, and then the dice would roll down the wee steps at the front of it. And because the Romans were very big into their gambling, and they were very big into the idea that you know it was the gods were predetermining how things would, would fall out. So you know it was that idea you chuck your dice into the tower, and then Lady Luck takes over, and as they tumble down those steps at the front, um, you get your outcome for the dice. And this particular one has an inscription on the front that reads, the pits have defeated, the enemy deleted, play in safety. Um, so very, very nice. It was actually found in Germany. Um, it's dated to about the um, uh, 4th century. Uh, so nicely ties in with that reference that Euenimus makes to the pits. So again, it's not too difficult to imagine though that some um, legionary had been moved from one front line to another front line, so been moved from Britannia and Adrian's Wall, been sent out to Germanica um, to, to deal with recalcitrant um, Germanic tribes, and taken with them this little artifact that was <coughs> made um, by some tradesman um, living on the wall who was probably turning these out um, and making it killing. <laughs> Uh, selling them to, to um, gambling addict, addicts in the, um, the Roman army um, and perhaps designed and brought out to commemorate some great victory that isn't recorded in, in, in the historical documentation but you know just something that meant uh, something to these um, men. So it's a very lovely little um, reference to it. So the Roman um, historians uh, and in fact, even the Brythonic um, uh, uh, historians of that sort of like fourth century are a tremendous source of information, documentary information about it. And so we have written information from that saying that in the year uh, 367, the Picts and the Scots teamed up and did a coordinated attack across Hadrian's Wall. What they actually did was, they, as well as attacking it and bashing down gates or scaling the wall, they very deftly just sailed around the end of it <laughs> at Wall's End and near Newcastle and um, on, the, on the Solway as well and landed on the southern side of it and gave the roads. You know, somebody should have told Donald Trump that when he decided he was going to build the wall. <coughs> uh, you know, there's, there's no keeping folk out if, you want, if they want to get in. Um, so, and it seems in a way that the presence of the Romans as this one focal point um, uh, of, a, of an enemy served to unite 
the different tribes, that all those different names that the Romans wrote down of all these different people, they would have all had their own interests. They were probably at various times fighting each other over boundary disputes and over land and whatever else. But there's nothing like, you know, a common enemy to say, you know, my, my enemy's enemy is my friend. And it seems that from around this time, um, the, the, the tribes people of um, living beyond the wall start to coalesce into fewer tribes, but bigger, getting more towards nations, kingdoms, um, and sometimes even, as we, we see here, teaming up with people of a different language and a different culture to hit out at the folk who are seen as the common enemy. And that, that whole kind of thing just continues on um, for quite a while. But round about 410, Rome abandons Britannia. They're having trouble on mainland Europe from uh, all manner of barbarian enemies who are bearing down on the empire, pushing the boundaries <coughs> and threatening Rome itself. So they eventually decide that actually it isn't worth a candle paying legionaries to be stationed here on this wee island. Let's just call them all back, defend the homeland, and the Britons, well, you just, you have to look after yourselves. We're leaving you a nice wall. That's, that was the deal. But the historical documentation tells us that they, they were still being plagued by attacks um, over the wall, round the wall. Um, I don't know whether they've done any tunnels under it, but um, they, were, they were given a, a, a hard time. And it's about this time, um, probably just slightly before the Romans, uh, before they leave, the numbers are certainly starting to drop down, uh, the, the, the size of the, 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 um, the legions based here. So it's about that time that the um, Brythonic people down in the south start to invite Germanic um, folk, so uh, over to, as mercenaries to help them fight these um, marauding people from north of the wall. So Saxons, Ibels, Dukes, Franks, um, paying them to come across and be um, sort of like uh, bouncers on the wall. Um. And what happens over the next century is that more and more of these people come across and they suddenly realise actually we are more powerful than the folk that are paying us. So we should just take control and we'll call this our place. And that's what they did. And they, I don't think there's any thought that the, the, of, of them doing some mass annihilation of the British people. Um, they probably killed enough people to convince the others that we are now in charge. Um, and then they would have stopped. Um, you know, you, just, you, you, you kill the elite, you kill the king, the chieftain, um, his henchmen, and anybody that's picking up a sword to defend him. And eventually, when the fight stops, you just say to everybody that's left, point to the dead guy and say, he used to be in charge, it's now me. Okay? Um, and at that point then, the Germanic lang language starts to become the language of power in uh, southern Britannia. And the, the Brythonic culture is really pushed into the western extremes, like Wales and, um, for a while, Cornwall. And, and the Ibels and the Saxons, um, they take over the rest, and they eventually the Ibels give their name to England, and their language becomes the English language. Um, uh, and the native cultures pushed into the West, out of the way, and the Anglo-Saxons refer to these other people as foreigners, which is kind of funny because they were the foreigners that came in, but they refer to the natives over there as foreigners, and the Anglo-Saxon word for foreigner was Welsh. So those foreigners there, they were Welsh, because the Welsh did they call themselves Welsh, they were Britons. And they would have tribal names as well, um, uh, which again is uh, historically documented, but um, the name Welsh gets coined by the Anglo-Saxons and it just means foreigner. Um, so people get hit up about nationalities and names. It's um, quite interesting. The name, the Scots, also the first references that we have to the Scotty uh, that the, um, the Romans write down, again, is probably coined originally as a pejorative term. Different scholars have different notions of what it might mean. Horde, just a throng, a mass 
or some people think pirate as well. Um, so again, it's not a, it's not a national, nationality that people have adopted themselves, it's something that's given to them and it sticks. And that seems to be um, uh, the way of it, it just seems to be that for long enough, everybody around about them referred to the people here as Picts. So eventually they just start answering to the name because that's what everybody else thinks they are. And eventually they start saying, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a Pict, yeah, I, I'm king of the Picts, because it's what everybody else tells them that they are. Um, <coughs> Those Anglo-Saxons that take over Southern Britannia eventually, um, by about the 6th um, century, start pushing northward and the, 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 um, the Kingdom of Northumbria expands up into Southern Scotland, uh, into the, uh, the borders, Lothian, uh, and they start to hem in the Britons, so that the Britons are pushed into kind of like Strathclyde and, and Western Galloway, um, just being hemmed in um, by Saxon expansion. And the Saxons then try and spread up into Pickland as well, but um, uh, we'll deal with that in a minute as to what happens with their, their attempts to do that. The Picts themselves left virtually no written history. Everything that's written about them is written by their neighbours. Um, uh, and that's useful, but it can also be I think at times, again, I'm, I'm no scholar, I'm no historian, but to me, reading some of what is written down by people like Beat, I think you have to take it with a pinch of salt, because sometimes he's not necessarily interested in recording a truth, sometimes he's interested in presenting a version of a story that suits his side of things. So I think sometimes you get a little bit of myth and legend and, and just general nonsense woven in uh, to some of the history that's written down. Uh, but what, one of the best sources, and you can look at this online, the Annals of Ulster is like a diary kept by the, the monks and the, 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 the clerics over in Ireland, and it's like a jungle, um, and they record all the big events that happen in their, their world, and their world extends into um, the Dalriata of the Scots and Pitland and, and, and Anglo-Saxon as well. So they record when one king dies and another takes over, when one king is killed in battle, when somebody is defeated, when somebody is victorious. Um, it, it, it's a fantastic source and is again probably quite often events there you can correlate with other records that other people keep. So there's a, a greater degree of truth there. Uh, and less spin going on. Um, so always, if you're looking for interest, Google Annals of Ulster, and um, it's a, a fantastic source to, to dip into and, and look at what's happening year by year. Um, so they left virtually no uh, history uh, written down. Um, either they had no tradition of it, or nothing survives. I think probably the latter. Um, uh, because as we will see when we come to it, they are eventually converted to Christianity. We have churches, we have monasteries here, and those monasteries are producing um, fabulous illuminated manuscripts that just none have survived. We've got archaeological evidence to, to prove that they were producing vellum, um, the purpose for which was almost always like um, making uh, manuscripts. Nothing has survived. So maybe they had a, a written history, but it's just all been destroyed and lost. Um, but the one thing they did leave us was this wealth of stone sculpture. And the best thing they're known for are the, um, the symbol stones. Uh, the things of great beauty to my eye. Um, they are strange, uh, enigmatic. They have no parallels anywhere at all. But having said that, you can see within the ornament that's used to decorate these things, um, you can see that it's part of a continuum of Celtic art, um, uh, Latin Celtic art that starts off in Central Europe back in the early Iron Age and then spreads um, sort of west and north through um, what is now France and then up into the British Isles and, and Ireland. Um, and then as the world changes and moves on, um, we really end up with, um, well, Britain, pre-Roman, is, is producing Celtic art, 
Um, but then when Southern Britannia gets Romanised, it really only is left to Scotland and Ireland um, to be the, 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 the centres of this, where this ornament, this tradition uh, of um, uh, art is carried on and developed. And I think British symbols are just part of that continuum. But graphically, um, when they're at their best, um, I think they just have an amazing vitality um, and a balance and a poise and um, oh, don't get me started. <coughs> uh, usually on a stone, the symbols are paired. More often than not, one above the other, but on occasion, they have side by side. And I think that's probably a practicality because of fairly squarish lump of stone, so I think we didn't, if you were going to put two symbols one above the other, you'd have to shrink them down really small, so I think they just went side by side. Sometimes um, to this pair of symbols, a mirror and a comb is added. Mirror and comb. So these are actual artefacts, and you're, you're probably familiar with this one. This is one of the, the roadside um, upper level stones, a very, very beautiful one. Again, the, 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 just going back to what we see there, the, the, the dynamic quality of this, um, by angling this symbol in the way that it does have, it just looks like it's, I mean, it's, it's like you see mold, isn't it? It's, it's got that thing, you know, when you dig that many money trees, that's what it looks like. It's just, it's, it's, it's like a bolt of lightning going up from the ground up, up into the heavens. Um, absolutely fantastic. Early thoughts on the mirror and comb was that it sim uh, uh, symbolised a, a female connection to the, to the stone. And then, round about the 1980s, folks started saying, oh, that's a bit sexist, mirror and comb, just women that comb their hair and are bothered about their appearance. Pictish men were just as vain. But there is actually some archaeological evidence. We've got a stone in Sutherland that was found capping a kissed burial. And the stone has two symbols and a mirror and a comb, and the, the interment inside that was a female skeleton. So there is some archaeological evidence that by no means clinches the deal, but there's some archaeological evidence pointing to the fact that this could be um, signifying female. Um, some of the symbols are geometric shapes, they're using crescents, circles, rectangles, squares, and um, Sometimes they have rods passing through them or over them. We've got a V rod and a Z rod. Um, uh, and once or twice we actually just have a straight rod as well. Um, sometimes the symbols depict real animals and you can actually um, identify them. It's not just a fish, it's a salmon. It's a red deer. There's a goose. We've got a snake, and again, with the, the kind of V pattern that's on it, it's almost certainly an adder. Um, very definite wolf, looking lean and hungry. Um, and this one here, open to debate, but for me, I think it looks like a seal, kind of dog like head, and a pair of flippers, and then straight along the bottom there is that's the water level where the, the, the head and the, the top of the torso is sticking out. Unusually, this stone is, comes from Rainey in the heart of Aberdeenshire, miles from the sea, so why they should be um, symbolising a seal, because uh, this is the only example of this particular symbol, um, so why that should appear in the heartland of Aberdeenshire, a long way from the coast, uh, I don't know, but part of the mystery. Uh, we have a fantastic um, wild boar there, it's uh, slightly damaged, but even has part of the tusk coming out there, it's just been broken off a bit, but um, wonderful. And then eagles, and we can actually discern two different species. This one here, the feathers stop high up in the legs, so that's a white tailed or a sea eagle, so because it's got bald legs, a bit like an osprey for catching its prey in the water. And then this chappy here, his feathers are coming all the way down to his talons, so that's a golden eagle. And then sometimes we have fantastical creatures. Um, this thing here that's sometimes referred to as a Pictish beast, a, a dolphin, a Pictish dolphin, a swimming elephant, it's all manner of um, names. Um, 
The head is quite dolphin-like, but it's certainly with limbs like that, um, I don't think it is a representation of a dolphin, because I think, for me, I would argue that their animals, when they depict them, are absolutely certain. They're well observed, they're, they're well executed, and there's no ambiguity when you look at um, the others. Um, there's just no ambiguity in what the animal is. So I think if they wanted to portray a dolphin, I think it would look like a dolphin, um, and this one doesn't. So I think it's a hybrid creature. I think it's a fantastical thing. But it's just referred to as the Pictish beast. So what do they mean? Well, the truth is, nobody knows for certain. And I don't think we ever will, unless we find some Pictish, British equivalent of the Rosetta Stone that has things written down in several different languages. If that's basically that's the Rosetta Stones, Egyptian hieroglyphs, and ancient Greek and Latin, and it's basically it's it's all about laws. So it, it writes down these laws and then it puts them in different languages so that it's you can't say it in the game because it's there for you because it's written down. And unless we find an approval for Pictish sculpture, we're always only going to be guessing. Um, but the clever people, who I admire immensely, all reckon that it's a form of writing that has emerged in this kind of late Roman um, uh, environment. The Romans are putting up stones all over the place wherever they go. Right along their walls, they're putting up milestones dedicated to the legions that built them, uh, with inscriptions with writing on it. They're putting up um, shrines to their gods with writing on it. So I it seems quite likely that the Picts thought, well, we do this as well. But they didn't use a Latin language or a Latin alphabet. Uh, but they invented their own thing and came up with these symbols. And the front runner for an explanation at the moment, again, amongst the, the people who I would credit as being clever, um, uh, is that they are personal names. So, you know, um, you've got a first name and a second name, or maybe your ex son of Y. Um, or ex daughter of all, that might be what we've got here. We don't know whether it reads ex son of one, reading top to bottom, or maybe it's the other way around, <coughs> ex son of Y. That one that's put side by side, does it go left to right, or right to the left? We don't know what convention they follow. But form of writing and personal names, I think, seems like a very plausible um, thing. There are all manner of very implausible hypotheses out there. Um, I, you know, but you know, it's a free world. You can you can go along with some of them you want. But I, I reckon this is a, a fairly good and uh, plausible explanation. <coughs> and we've got a wee bit of something that might actually just back this up. There's a form of writing called ogham. It originates in Ireland, connected with Christianity, and it's brought over into Pictland. And we've got somewhere in the region of forty plus. I'm guessing inscriptions in Pictland written in Ogham. It looks a bit like runes. This is it here, and it's about strokes either running onto, off, or across um, uh, the central stem line, and different numbers of strokes give you an alphabet. <coughs> and so this stone here, this Pictish stone, is part of a cross slab, has an Ogham inscription running up here. The Ogham does read, they nearly always read from bottom to top. So again, that's a, an unusual convention when we're, when we're used to reading down a page. This Ogham reads up the way. And what it translates as is this. We've got the Nodnat Mac Neto. Now, we don't, fairly impenetrable, but they're almost certainly personal names. And the Mac, M-A-Q-Q, -Q, is a phonetic um, representation similar to the Gallic Mac, meaning son of. So we don't know whether we've lost some letters at the bottom, so the Danodnat might not be, there might have been something before the D there. Adanodnat, Edanodnat, who knows? And certainly it has broken off here, so the Neto almost definitely carries on, and that's only a little part of the name. But to say that this stone has a dedication on it um, to this person called Danodnat, who is the son of Nato something, 
um, and to have that description sitting alongside some symbols, um, again, I think to me makes a fairly compelling argument that those symbols, when read by the people in the vicinity of where the stone was erected, they would have known that that is what we went through last year. And they would have known that these two symbols represent him, son of whoever. So I think that seems like a, a very plausible explanation as to what, what the symbols mean. Um, and therefore the addition of a mirroring comb, if it is a signifier of female, maybe that then becomes daughter of rather than son of. Why were they erected? Well, <coughs> grave markers possibly. Um, but that's just one reason um, why. I, I, a colleague of mine, when I first joined the Commission, said to me, you know, if you look at the number of reasons why we erect a stone monument today, it could be to commemorate the birth of somebody, it might be to commemorate the death, it might be to commemorate the place where the body is interred, it might commemorate a land boundary, it might commemorate a wedding and a marriage between two different families, two different people, all might, it might be commemorating a person who was um, uh, victorious in a battle, or you know, a whole load of reasons why you might want to remember somebody. Um, so maybe we shouldn't just look for one reason for um, why the Picts erected um, stones with symbols on them. Um, but grave markers are certainly one possible reason, and we do have a couple of examples where um, this one was found near Grattan Spey, and this one is found up in Caithness, and they were found lying on or, or at the bottom of a cairn, a, a, a mound, which is almost certainly a burial cairn, with, with, maybe with a kist and a body in it. So it kind of looks like they were erected on uh, that, and so maybe that is commemorating uh, the person uh, buried in these mounds. But there are other possible reasons why they might have done so. Um, Uncertainty about the language, uh, the absence of a written history, the enigmatic nature of the, the symbols, this is all led to the Picts being viewed um, as markedly different. The, 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 all sorts of theories that, you know, maybe they're not British people at all, maybe they, they're, 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 there's one way of thought they're coming from like the steppes of Central Asia and locked down in northeast Scotland. Because um, you know they're, they're just they're going to be different to everybody else, and I don't think they were. I think modern archaeology is now given us a, a really good um, notion of them um, as just being part and parcel of one of the, the the dark age, the early medieval peoples of Scotland and of Britain, um, and they just went about their life like like their neighbours. And sometimes they made war against them. Sometimes they teamed up. It's a little bit like a, book, a game of risk. You and me will team up and we'll go and invade him and we'll divide up the land and the spoils. And, but when they weren't warring with each other, they traded with each other, they, they traded goods, they traded ideas, artistic styles. Um, the royals and the nobles and probably the common people intermarried. We only know about the, royal, the royals intermarrying is that it's only the life of the royals that gets recorded down in the annals of Ulster, but we know that, you know, Pictish kings took Prothonic wives and vice versa, and, uh, and that goes on. And uh, again, the, the Northumbrian church, the Northumbrians various times are always trying to invade and do a land grab, but at other times the, the Northumbrian church is sending up um, masons to show the Picts how to build stone churches and how to, to, um, to, to worship God better. In, in, in a better way. So um, they were really just part and parcel of the scene of um, early medieval Britain. Um, and as I say, modern archaeology has really given us a fantastic insight into that. Um, it's not completely clear, but you can hopefully make out a series of circles in this field. And that's that's big, I mean, that's a huge uh, area that, that that is. And these circles, that they, they come up in the field when it's either in wheat or barley, that kind of crop, and it shows where the land has been disturbed. 
So if you've got a stone wall or a stone feature that's now buried underground, the crop there will dry out and ripen a lot faster because it's got less moisture in the ground. And conversely, if you've dug a big ditch, even 5,000 years ago, and then it's been filled in, that disturbed soil holds more moisture and the crop there will stay greener longer than the stuff around about it. So these are called crop marks and I've got colleagues who go out and fly over Scotland and they love hot, long, hot, dry summers so they must be, they must be having great fun these last few years. Um, so this is, uh, these circles represent um, a series of ditches and palisaded walls um, like big oak um, boards erected to make a defensive wall around and uh, Professor Gordon Noble from Aberdeen Uni excavated this about 10 years ago now, it's quite a while, and found an amazing thing. At the centre of this is a sort of um, palatial house, a royal, certainly a chieftain, probably a king, um, and we've got fantastic archaeological evidence from that. Um, oh, sorry, went a bit too fast there. Um, we've got high status um, goods coming out of this. The, the, Jewellery, moulds for the casting of jewellery, so they're working in precious metals, um, and even little broken shards of a style of drinking glass that originates from somewhere around Marseille. Um, so, and this is Rainy, this is the heart of Pickland in deepest Aberdeenshire. So, whatever chieftain or king was living there was drinking something out of very fine southern French wine glasses. So, Chances are he's probably quaffing a nice red wine that's been brought up in an amphora and traded and, so, and maybe in exchange he's given out some of the jewellery that's been made on site. And so these people are not on the fringes, they're not some weird thing that's up there and I'll best not speak to them. They are part and parcel of, of early medieval Britain and the early medieval Europe. There's nothing other about them. It is very definitely tied in with um, their neighbours and their contemporaries. Interestingly, at the side of the entrance, I don't know if we can make it out, I think it's somewhere about there, the entrance into this enclosure, the stone stands in situ, this symbol stone, it's just put to one side of the gateway into the circular enclosure with this, um, uh, this kind of chieftains or king's house. And on the other side of the doorway, Gordon found a socket, a stone setting that would have held another stone that's now missing. And interestingly, again, about maybe 20 years ago, this fabulous one, known as the Rainy Man, this came up and um, was ploughed up. This, you can see the change in the colour of the floor. This, this is kind of like a flat platform. And then from there, the field slopes quite steeply down to the river. And this was found by the plough down about here. So it looks like it's just fallen and then either dried down over the years or slid down. So maybe that was what was set up on the other side of the entrance into this. So it's not impossible that the granddad was buried outside the front door, you know, when you commemorate them and you might want to have the body nearby so you can uh, revere it. Um, but maybe these stones are just marking the identity of the guy that's living in there, maybe that's the, 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 like the nameplate that's on the front door. Um, just an interesting possibility there. Eventually, the Picts are converted to Christianity. Um, early references talk about St. Ninian um, coming up to convert the southern Picts, either in the, the late 4th or the early 5th century, but there's not an awful lot of evidence about that. It's, um, that would be like one of the, the great things to find is some kind of his sculptural or physical evidence that would tie in some kind of Ninianic connection. We've got some name places and some dedications to the saint, um, but nothing much um, solid. Um, much um, more likely, and certainly having leading to a bigger um, success, is Columba. Um, he establishes his church of Iona in 563, and within two years, he's heading north with a delegation to go up and see um, the Pictish king brother, 
whose citadel is on the hill fort just overlooking Inverness, um, and he makes his way up there, famously banishing a monster that was in the loch. Um, uh, so you know, that's perhaps the, the earliest reference to the Loch Ness monster. <coughs> he performed all manner of other miracles um, uh, on his way up there, helping to create his saintly status uh, as he went. He, he doesn't convert the king immediately, but the king is impressed by him, um, uh, uh, by his eloquence and by his um, bravure, um, take him all the way up there and tell him that whatever god you're worshipping, it's the Romans, and you know, you've got to get the right one. Um, <coughs> so, um, there's no immediate conversion there, but within the next, over the next century, um, certainly we start to see um, the evidence of missionaries moving in out from Iona and Elmiata and up and into Pictland and round the coast and we, we can see sculptural evidence of that. Um, whether these people were just braving it or whether they end up getting the um, tacit agreement of local chieftains or kings, we're not sure of, but given that the church has survived long enough for them to start carving stones and commemorating and marking the burial grounds of their, um, their own kind, it seems likely that they are being allowed, <coughs> at the very least tolerated, um, um, but eventually Picts are converted and we end up with Pictish churches and Pictish monasteries and fairly big ecclesiastical um, uh, uh, establishments. And here's a little bit of the evidence that survives. This is a this is a cross slab from Iona, and then these two are found up in Aberdeenshire. We can see an absolute direct correlation there between the, the style and the motif of the cross. And um, so you, you have to kind of assume that somebody with that design in mind went from Iona, ended up in Blankery and Tullock on D side. And then when it came time to, to bury one of their own and um, mark the, the place with a stone, there was a design in, in mind um, uh, to come from. And again, similarly, a couple of little um, motifs again from Iona, and then virtually identical parallels found in different parts of Aberdeenshire. Um, well, truth they might be why, I, I, I'm not 100% sure. Um, and of course, the, 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 the particular um, form of a cross that is most commonly used on Pictish sculpture is the ringed cross, the Celtic cross uh, with the ring. And that originates, that whole style originates on Iona with St. John's cross for a very pragmatic reason. St. John's cross, and this is four metres high at least, um, and it's made, it's not carved out of one big bit of stone, but it's composite. It's made out of one, two, three, four, five pieces of stone, I think, and they're using woodwork joints, so it's mortise and tenon joints for stone to put all together. The head of the cross, the arms of the cross are socketed in to the centre bit, and then the centre bit is socketed into the shaft. So it's composite. It's like somebody who knows how to work in wood has translated that construction method into stone, and it just it didn't work, it kept falling over, it kept falling off, the, the arms of the cross kept shooting loose in the wind and falling and getting damaged. So they came up with this idea that they would carve four more pieces of stone to support, and they again, so these pieces had tenons and they, 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 they cut sockets to fit that in. And so that design is created for a purely practical point of view, it's, it's just four bits of stone to support the rest of the cross and hold it up. But it then becomes the very potent motif and it becomes the most common form of cross on Pictish sculpture without a doubt. So by the 7th century, the Picts are carving their own crosses and this one at Glams is probably uh, one of the earliest ones that we have. The style of carving is kind of transitional. It's carved in relief, but quite shallow relief. <coughs> and the symbols that are on it are kind of incised, but 
false relief. Um, uh, so it's like a transitional thing. And, and on the back of it, we actually have incised Pictish symbols. So it may have started off as a symbol stone. It probably actually started off as a Bronze Age standing stone with cut marks on it, because we've got cut marks down here at the bottom on the plinth that it's been left carved. And then it's been dressed and shaped and turned into maybe a simple stone to begin with, and then this um, pedimented cross slab. And by, um, and also, yeah, of course, um, this one here, we can see Pictish symbols on the front here, um, and on this one, we've got Pictish symbols on the back. So symbols get taken over onto the Christian sculpture. There is no clash of message. And again, that's another. I think a very convincing reason why these are not pagan symbols, they don't represent pagan gods, there is no um, conflict there. Uh, so if this is a burial marker of a Christian pit, then perhaps his identity is being recorded on the back with the presence of the symbols. By the 8th century, we see the establishment of major churches and monasteries like St. Pigeons and like Nego, where big assemblages as are carved over the, over the years, so over, over a, a kind of decades or maybe even a century of um, use of, of the place. Um, monumentally big, um, some of them. The cross slab is definitely the monument of choice for the picks, and that is, that is their go-to um, type of thing. The Scots liked freestanding crosses, the Anglo-Saxons liked freestanding crosses, high crosses, the Irish liked freestanding crosses, but the pits really like a slab where they could just put lots and lots of imagery and detail. So it's not just about creating a cross, again with a ring here, we're getting ornament, we're getting figurative um, things either side. It's, it's kind of sumptuous and it, it's, it's very tempting to see these as being influenced by um, illuminated manuscripts and we have no Pictish illuminated manuscripts surviving but they almost certainly made them we've just lost them um, and it's very tempting to see this richness of imagery that appears on the cross slab as being a kind of stone version of a page from a, from a manuscript um, but Assemblages like St. Pigeons show this, that as well as the slab, they have a huge range of sculptural forms that they employ. So we've got recumbent monuments which sat on the ground or maybe on a plinth, and um, they have a little socket in them, uh, presumably to hold something upright, an upright slab, an upright freestanding cross. <coughs> um, probably stone, but maybe wood, who knows. Um, we don't have any, nothing, we find these at legal and St. Virgins and in Dotted and other places as well, and we have nothing surviving that's just the right size to fit into that. A few of the fra fra fragments fit in, but they're broken, so it's kind of difficult to see, certainly, because I don't think we're putting broken things in. <coughs> and what we don't have is a nice monument with a tenon that's just the size of the socket to, to put it in, and um, so a little bit of an enigma. <coughs> We have three standing crosses, big and small. This is a tiny little one, <coughs> would have been about a metre high, a yard, three feet high. But there's one of the fragments in St. Virgin's, which when you reconstruct it, it's the same size as the arm of St. Martin's Cross or Iona. It's very similar in style to St. Martin's Cross. And when you reconstruct it and put it on its side and, 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 and kind of recreate it, it ends up being somewhere in the region of about three metres high. So big boundary markers or processional crosses or sort of focal points within the, the, the monastery grounds. Um, we have a shrine shaped monument that's it's made with this um, kind of tegulated roof. It's supposed to look like um, shingles, a shingled roof. Um, uh, and we've got this thing uh, over the museum here. It's now, it's been mutilated and cut up and about, but it basically it's been a little pillar cross, so a cross on each side, but it's just this little modelled pillar column rather than a freestanding cross or a slab. 
very, very lovely thing, um, with no parallel elsewhere. So, a tremendous range of um, uh, different monument types um, were being created here. And the workshop would have been here, they would have had their, their stone masons and their carvers um, working within the monastery precinct. And as I say, St. Vincent's has it's actually got more than its fair share of unusual and even unique things. <coughs> St. Vincent's and Beagle are very, very similar. The, the size of the collection is very close, 30 plus stones at each site. The, the, the type of stones are similar uh, in each place. Meagle's always had the upper hand because I think it's prettier. Meagle has more complete stones, so I think it's always been viewed as being nicer. It's the one that gets most attention, it's the one that gets most of the um, sort of focal uh, attention put onto it. But actually, if, if we were playing top trumps, St. Bridget's wins hands down mm -hmm. without stuff. But what is a little um, uh, pillar cross, unique, only here at St. Bridget's. We've got this lovely little um, uh, inscription at the foot of uh, one of the cross slabs. The stone's called the Droston Stone because the, the, the inscription has the name Droston. Uh, and it it's, looks like it's three names, Droston, Ike, Eora, Ike, Forcus, Fergus. So probably three personal names. It's down at the bottom corner and I think the view is it's basically you kneel down to pray for the, the, the three souls of these people. I'm very tempted to see that room is left for other folk, but uh, no other names. And so, inscriptions on the crosses, it's not unique, but it's relatively rare. We've only got mm, ballpark figures, something like 10 in, in, in all of Scotland, and certainly Eagle doesn't have one, so it's, it's a, definitely a, a point up for some victims. <coughs> Other little bit of um, uh, uh, evidence of what we see here, we've got a little fragment of an Ogham inscription carved on the narrow edge of one of the smallest fragments in the museum. And it's been carved with a knife. Nobody's had to chisel it out like normally um, you would do. Usually, depending on the stone, um, if it's fine sandstone, you can chisel quite fine lines. We've got Ogham inscriptions on granite where you can run your thumb down in it because you, you can't really carve where the picks couldn't carve very fine detail in granite just with a cold steel chisel so it's a um, very very deeply um, a groove um, inside it but this has been cut with a knife and it's it's actually double R there's the stem line and then we've got five diagonal strokes and then one two three four incomplete ones and just the tip of the fifth one there so it's double R it's this double consonant given a kind of phonetical iteration of part of a personal name probably, but it's another bit of evidence of a literary presence here at St. Bridget's. And again, something that Eagle doesn't have. And this is the stone which the organ was on. It's on this narrow edge of this tiny little fragment, number six. It's 240 millimetres, so what's that in money? 10 inches, tiny, tiny thing. It is sumptuously carved. You will not find better carving anywhere in Bickland. <coughs> yes, it is absolutely top of the range, absolute superb thing. And for a long, long time, it just confused the hell of people as to what this was, because there's no real evidence of a cross onto this. <coughs> say, you can't, it can't be a freestanding cross you don't get symbols on freestanding crosses. And this is where I have to diverge with scholars. We really shouldn't be saying what you can and can't have because we don't make the rules, we just interpret them from a long distance, from more than a thousand years, and with a very incomplete picture. So I, 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 I get very wary when I hear scholars using always and never. We really shouldn't be doing that. Um, we can say usually, you usually get this, you usually don't get that. It would be highly unusual if you did. Um, but it was said for a long time, um, you don't get Pictish symbols on a freestanding cross because you don't ever get them within the space of a cross on a slab. So it was thought that 
the space of the cross is set aside, and so that's why the signals go either to the side of it or on the back where it's on the slab. And then back when I was working on the collection here and working with Jane Geddes, she just looked at this because it, it was bothering me as to what, how to reconstruct this, what to make of it. And she said, looked at it and turned it around the other way because it used to be it sat like that in the museum with this taper pulled up and it would be gone. So it's a very small slab with a taper on it. But on the other side, with this interlaced, there's no hint of a cross. And she just turned it the other way around and said, it's the head of a freestanding cross. <coughs> and you put it into that concept, you think, of course it is. It's like the two of them. Um, but, and we were in this very room for our Pictish Art Society conference in 2008, when she put this up on the screen for the first time. And we had some very scholarly people in the audience who went, <laughs> what about that? They've come around and they've accepted that this is what it is. It's an absolutely unique uh, example, but that's, we shouldn't be saying, oh, if, if it were that, it would be unique. Because uniques, you know, it's only unique until we find the next one, and then it becomes rare. Um, uh, but, so that's really what it is. At the head of this little freestanding cross, about maybe just over a metre high, 1.2, 1.4 metres high, um, was this pictish double disc in set rod, and on the narrow edge of it there was an organ inscription which probably ran down there and along there and maybe over the top um, just with a dedication to whoever um, this um, cross was commemorating. Sometimes on the stones the symbols get written large. You'll probably be familiar with this. This is the big roadside cross lab at Aberlendo. Um, and on the reverse of it, we have two Pictish symbols, a crescent bee rod, a double disc and set rod, and they are the full width of the stone. That they're, it's this size. Massive. Um, so whatever message they're imparting with this, they're saying it loud and proud. Um, this, is, this, is, this, this is a loud message that's being um, projected here. But also by this time, I think this is probably dated to the dating I tend to leave to the art historians. Um, uh, it's a little bit of a mystery, and I, I don't venture into it. I just quote what they say. But I think this is dated to um, probably the late eighth, maybe early ninth century. Um, and by this time, the symbols are becoming, as well as whatever message <coughs> this is conveying, whatever name it represents, they're becoming. Uh, um, a vehicle for ornament as well, so we, we can see the crescent infilled with this fabulous key pattern and the double discs uh, infilled with the spiral motif, so it's, they're, they're, they're becoming very ornamental as well as um, uh, just the, the shape of the symbol. It's also worth, just while we're here, looking at um, this as a perfect example of the sumptuousness of the carving. How it, looks like the page from a manuscript and particularly I mean there's just there's no bit of the stone that is not ornamented or carrying some message conveying an image and um, it is just completely covered and the style of the cross up here with these settings almost certainly it's been influenced by um, a piece of metal work maybe like an altar cross or um, maybe some kind of medallion or brooch, because these look like settings for stones. And it's been postulated that maybe there was something set into these exotics here, enamel or something that made them look rich and glorious. Um, but certainly it is just end-to-end um, -end decoration, an um, absolute masterpiece. Um, talking about Pictish symbols representing names. One of the little fragments from St. Vigens here, in fact, it's actually two which we've managed to show are probably joined and probably part of the same monument. And we've got this little button. Um, we've got this little guy here with his hood, so probably a monk. Um, actually, probably a bishop because the hang of it is a crozier. And it looks like he's on horseback. And just over his shoulder, we've got this very simple and plain, but very definite Pictish symbol, a double disc. So again, it's looking very like, by association, 
from wherever he was. That was his marker. But this might have been a second symbol here. Um, there might have been a second symbol elsewhere on the stone. But it looked very like, um, by association, that this symbol is put close to the figure being depicted. So again, it might well be that this is um, confirmation of those traditional <coughs> names. And we've got another example on this one from Kirinmuir, again, a fabulous um, stone. And here we have this Pictish noble in all his finery. Um, this one's in the Meffin. If you've not been to see it, go and have a look. It's absolutely brilliant. We were talking earlier about um, mirrors and combs and whether it had to be females, that only, only females that cared about their appearance. This guy's beard is plaited into like a Mr. Flippy. Um, it's a, I imagine it. It's like put any hipster to shame. It's absolutely fantastic. And then over his shoulder, we've got this little build this concertoid. So again, that looks to be his name signifier um, uh, carved on the stone. But by this time, we're really looking at the decline of Pictish symbols. Um, and, uh, this is as good an example as any of that decline, because this thing over his shoulder is supposed to be a double disc in Sevrod. Now, there's a nice, good graphic example of a double disc in Sevrod. That Sevrod looks like a bolt of lightning, whereas the Sevrod, for his symbol, looks more like a daffodil or a stick of lip celery. It's, um, it's lost its brother, it really has, and I think that's a sign of the decline of the Pictish culture. And that, for me, I think what that means is that the guy who carved the stone, it's a beautifully carved, it's a beautifully carved stone, but he's now maybe a generation, two generations removed from the production of symbols, and it's not part and parcel, it's not in part of his artistic vocabulary. He's having to search his memory or go by a description that somebody's given him. Oh, a couple of simple couple of circles and do that for my oh, right, right, love at home. And it's just it's it's not part of a living culture anymore. It's just it's it's on the way out. Um, and I think that's a perfect example. And we, we can see that on other simple stones. I think there's the tendency to think that the simple stones come first and then the cross slabs with symbols, and then the cross paths without symbols. And that is a, that's a kind of, um, it's a sequence for development, but I don't think it means that they, they only ever appeared in that. I'm pretty certain there were people still carving symbol stones when there were folk carving cross paths. Deep into the heart of Pictland, you, you go up into the deepest Aberdeenshire, um, like the State Valley, hardly any Christian sculpture there at all, it's all symbol stones. Whereas down Angus Perthshire or up on the Murray Plain, um, it's the other way around. It's all about the cross slabs and hardly any simple stones. So I think the uptake of Christianity was differential in different parts of Scotland. And I think the simple stones carry on in production. But you can see in some of them, there's some from Aberdeenshire, there's some from Murray, where they've just lost the plot in what they're carving. There's a, an eagle carved on a stone from Inveravon on Speyside, and it looks like a cartoon parrot. It's got no eagle quality about it at all. Um, and again, I think that to me shows that this is just a generation or two down the line where it's no longer part of a living tradition. It's somebody giving it the best shot um, on, a, on a dying um, sort of cultural um, cul-de-sac. So I think there's a good sign here that, um, you know, with, with the current kind of your stone here, that the Pictish symbols are on the way out uh, from their, their cultural um, significance. And eventually they disappear from, from the sculptural repertoire and we end up with cross slabs that have no symbols on them at all. Still lots of detail, lots of imagery, but nothing um, overtly Pictish in, in, in that um, sort of cultural identifier. <clears throat> Pictish sculpture, the Christian the cross slabs, is rich with biblical imagery. Um, this is a cross slab from Farnell, um, just Farnell, just south of um, um, Brecon. And we've got what is widely taken as a depiction of Adam and Eve, <coughs> standing under an apple tree, 
eaves there folded, an apple in her hand, and you see there's an apple missing from the tree there. Not everybody buys that argument, but that's, I, I, I think that's what it is. But there are a little, little bit of problem with this, is traditionally Adam and Eve would have been naked and killed there and um, commit this, the sin, uh, and we can see these people are fully clothed with Pictish style robes. So, uh, and also, of course, we've got the serpent in attendance, but perhaps for the sake of symmetry, the stone carver's given us one down each side. So, it's a, it, it becomes this philosophical point as whether the, the word of the Bible precisely would be what should be followed, or whether there's artistic license being taken where people are maybe unaware that Adam and Eve are supposed to be naked, or thinking, well, if I put one serpent on the one side, it's going to look up a lot sided. I'm doing two serpents. Don't really know whether that's the case or not. Um, but it, all, it, leaves, it's, it leaves lots of wiggle room for art historians to have an argument about what, what it is isn't shown. Um, perhaps a better depiction, and a more definite depiction of Adam, is here on the little narrow edge of this week. <laughs> and there he is, biting into the apple, committing the sin, and immediately realising his nakedness is offensive. And covering his modesty with his other hand. So, pretty certain we've got Adam there. Um, this is the um, uh, big cross slab up in Aberdeenshire, um, the main stone, and the image at the top here, the figure flanked by two kind of sea monsters, is widely interpreted as being Jonah and the whale, but if it is, the whale's not made. Um, and that doesn't get mentioned. So again, are, is the interpretation wrong? Or has the sculptor just decided that symmetry and balance is more important than strictly following the, the word of the, the good book? And um, we leave it to the art historians to get fixed. Um, well, maybe it is in a bit more detail. Yeah, so if, if it is the whale, he's brought a friend. Um, and then, very common on quite a number of Pictish um, sculptures are these visual references to King David and the biblical king. So here we have him wrestling with the lion, rending the jaws of the lion. And um, there's his staff because he's the shepherd. There's his ram. There's his harp because he's a magician, and that's him as the warrior mounted there. Um, and there's, oh, I'd say maybe about a dozen um, uh, stones um, with. The, these visual references to David. So, first of all, it means that there's probably a royal connection with this stone. And the reason for that then is that if you want to make a kind of draw a parallel, if you're a king, and draw a parallel between yourself and somebody, David is the one to go for because he, he covers all the bases. He's, he's a good shepherd who does whatever it takes. Um, he'll look after his flock, even if it means going hand to hand with a lion. Um, he's a fierce warrior <coughs> tackles and defeats the lion. He's a man of the heart who, who sings, plays the harp, and, um, and so he's cultured. Um, and of course, importantly, he was predestined, pre predestined to be king. He's anointed um, a, 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 as a babe who's going to go into great things. So if you've got a claim to the throne and you want to solidify that claim, you want to identify yourself with David because he's got it all going for him and he's God's chosen, so you know, and I'm the same, so don't 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 don't, don't, don't be questioning anything here. Um, and that's we, we, we see this on at least a, a dozen um, stones I reckon, um, these visual references to King David. Uh, the evangelists quite often play a part, and this is a cross slab from Elgin, and it's again that our historians widely interpret that we've got the evangelists here, and certainly we can see what looks or could be St. Matthew with his attendant angel, and then we've got St. John with his eagle, but if either of these two winged people up here are supposed to be Mark or Luke, we've got no sign of the lion of the calf. So, again, slightly probably problematic um, with that, but grist to the mill of the art historians. And we have the same with um, uh, Mary Stone, this is in Breaking Cathedral, um, 
we've got very definite um, evil down here of St. John and the line of St. Mark, but if these two up here in the top quadrants of the, of the cross are supposed to be the others, then there's no sign of um, the bull or the cow. Um, so, um, one, one left a question mark on that too. And lots of angels, lots of different forms, but winged angels are um, a, a very popular motif on British sculpture. I just put this one because it's my absolute favourite for these um, sort of uh, ball teaser <laughs> and uh, wings coming down onto the feathers there. It's a fabulous um, image. As well as biblical stuff, we've got all manner of other images that have been portrayed on it. Uh, again, you'll be familiar with this in the kirkyard at Aberlendo. Um, uh, fabulous decorative motifs and, uh, on, on the cross line. But then on the back here, this fabulous battle scene, widely thought by many to be a representation of the Battle of Durkin. That's when um, the Northumbrian uh, King Ecrith decides he's going to annex Pickland into his imminent expanding kingdom. And he marches north with his army and, um, according, <coughs> according to Bede's uh, historical record of it, that the Picts were a bit underhand because they pretended to retreat. And when Ecrith and his army charged on, um, to, 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 to press home their victory, it turned out that the pigs were only kicking on to run over the hill and run away, and they came down the sides of the hill and engulfed the, the Republican army and beat them all open. And they killed the king, they killed his two sons, and Northumbria the thereafter um, stopped trying to expand into Pickland. So, for many people, this is uh, a depiction of that battle. It seems very likely because one army is wearing helmets that are very similar to. Things that have been found in the archaeological record. But not everybody um, agrees with that. Uh, the Hunt is another very, very popular um, secular uh, image presented on, um, uh, oh, on cross lines, rather. So, here again, this is from the Caribbean world. We've got this nobleman riding out, and he's got his hound that's just biting the, the, the deer by its scut. Tongue is rolling out there, it's been a long chase, and he's just about to thrust his spear into it. And then back to the big Aberlemo cross lab, we've got a whole entourage out on the hunt, including what looks like trumpeters there to raise the quarry and get them get them running, and then a whole horde of people riding out, and then at the bottom we have the deer and the hounds um, wheeling in uh, the quarry. And just out of interest, another in this little box here more visual reference to um, King David, that's him wrestling with a lion, and then we've got the sheep, and then the heart. Um, so again, probably a royal connection to this story. Um, oh, here we go. Um, but towards the end of the 8th century, the, the ball game changes, and in um, 793, we get the first record of a Viking raid on the Royal of Windus Farm in Northumbria. So that's about there. Um, and then two years later, Iona is hit down here off the tender bulb. And um, it seems likely, again, I think some of the, the kind of Norse scholars reckon that by the time the Vikings are coming down here, they've probably got a base uh, on what they have probably got a football. Um, uh, on there. And it's not long before <coughs> all the people, the different peoples of the country, start to, to lose battles and then lose territory. <coughs> they come first as raiders, but then it becomes a land grab. And before long, they have colonised um, the Shetland Islands, the Orkney Islands, <coughs> the Outer Hebrides, most of Caithness, Sutherland, and Easter Ross. Quite a lot of the inner Hebrides, they start pushing in on the Scots on the on the coastal periphery, and they sail up the Clyde and, and, and lay waste to um, the 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 Brythonic um, capital, and, and of course they're doing the same down south um, on, um, to the Anglo-Saxons, and eventually end up taking huge tracts of land. Um, <coughs> 
So, the Picts suffered a tremendous defeat. This is again re recorded in the annals in 839. Uh, the king, his sons, most of the nobility um, wiped out by um, uh, the Vikings. Um, it's King Brother the Sixth is um, killed. And in this power vacuum, Kenneth MacAlpin, who is a Scot, um, he's king of Delmiata, and he comes over and claims and takes the Pictish throne. Um, probably not all that peaceably, there was probably a bit of strife, but he ends up with the, the fact that the, the Picts are at a loss, having lost um, uh, this recent uh, um, sort of culling of their, 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 their base. Um, he manages to, to claim the throne and he becomes king of both Pictland and Dalriada. And he starts a dynasty that lasts um, quite a while. And his sons and his grandsons and great grandsons carry on um, to, to, to be um, uh, the kings of both countries. And by 889, Kenneth's grandson Ronald is crowned king of Alba. So at that point in time, the kingdom of Dalriata disappears, Pictland disappears, and this united place of those two kingdoms is referred to for the first time as Alba. Um, um, which of course is still the Gallic name um, uh, that survives today. And um, that really um, begins, uh, that's kind of like the beginning of the end um, for the Picts. But what happened to them? Well, the truth is nothing happened to them. They were not annihilated by the Scots. Again, like all like the Anglo-Saxons arriving in England, like the Vikings arriving in Orkney and Shetland, there was no massive ethnic cleansing where you just have to go kill everybody that had a Pictish surname or who didn't speak your language. You just have to kill enough people to take power and then everybody that's left pays their tax to the new guy or bows and scrapes to the new guy or whatever. Um, so the Picts live on in Alba um, uh, probably making up the largest proportion of its Population because they were certainly um, geographically had a wider spread than the Scots did. Um, but the picture has changed and the ruling class has changed. The ruling class are now Gaelics. And Gaelic, Gaelic, Gaelic is the language of power. Um, and uh, their culture becomes dominant, their language becomes dominant. And the Pictish language and the Pictish culture dwindles in significance and probably over the space of about two generations just disappears completely. And you can see modern parallels with Gaelic today in Scotland. 150 years ago it would have been very widely spoken in areas <coughs> from Perthshire, and it was right the way up and out to the west of Wales. But it then almost disappeared and it probably would have completely disappeared if it hadn't been for 20th century intervention that made a kind of positive discrimination that said no we should teach we should keep the language and the culture alive teach it in schools in parts of the highlands and the west of islands and encourage it um, uh, to, 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 to still be spoken uh, but if it hadn't been for that kind of proactive thing if it wasn't for a requirement of the bbc to do a certain amount of radio and television programs in Gaelic. I think it would have disappeared completely because you would get a job if you turned up at your local garage or your local co-op or whatever and you spoke in Gaelic and the manager said, what? So it doesn't take long for, for the language and the culture to disappear if, if um, folk don't want to use it, if, 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 if the, the folk that are in power have no reverence of it or use for it. So I think within a generation or two, um, Pictish language and culture was just subsumed into um, the Scots and Gaelic became the culture and the language for most of Scotland um, uh, at that time. But they did leave us a fantastic legacy in stone and um, from that point of view. Thank you very much.
few minutes, maybe ten minutes or so, if anybody has any questions to, to ask John or any comments, then we would like to hear from you. So, could I take any questions from you? Yes, the more controversial, the better. <laughs> or you can just leave. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody wants his money back. The last bit there reminds me very much of my own childhood where I grew up in Highland Perthshire, about three miles west of, of Aberfeldy, and I remember hearing of my father's oldest brother going to school without a word of English, and I remember many years later, I went to school without a word of Dalek. Yeah. So I quickly can disappear. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in your, your slides and most of those slides created by you. Yeah. Yes, that's mostly my work. That's that's okay. that's, that's what I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very so, very yeah. impressive. Yeah. 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 I did tell you something that was false earlier on. I said the first time I met or I met John for the first time when he was here in August, and he reminded me earlier on that that was not the case. But one day when I was coming home from work, I was passing the museum and I saw somebody sitting outside. And I wondered what was happening, so I stopped and spoke to this gentleman. And I, 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 it, was, it was John. He was somewhat younger then, so I don't know if he had a beard. I had a beard that just was the white. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so and, uh, John very kindly um, showed me what he was doing. And I remember him very impressed. He was sitting in front of the stones, and he had a, a light shining across the face of the stone. And that really picked out the detail yeah. amazingly well. Yeah. And uh, you know, the, work, the work is really, it, I think it says so much more than, than a picture. Mm. So I'm concerned that the kettle might not do well, but one yeah, question. No, I'm just going to ask, I know that a lot of these cabins were carved on, they were earlier in the uh -huh. Do you think that was just opportunity because of the size of them? Or do you think there was a. A little bit of both, a little bit of both. There's good. <laughs> archaeological evidence to show that when people want to um, make their mark on a landscape, they use a landscape where there's evidence of earlier people. And that's, that is common throughout history, through all ages and all different cultures. The Anglo-Saxons put their burial grounds in the way of prehistoric monuments. So these things had no cultural significance to them, they probably didn't know what they were. They certainly couldn't say that it was my granddad or my great granddad. These were thousands of years earlier and a different people. But it's kind of like somewhere sacred is sacred. Um, and so I think there is probably an element of a deliberate tying in with these earlier stone circles and standing stones. Partly opportunistic, so it's, you know, you could go and spend a few days, how can a great big one out of a rock face at the side of a river, or we could just use this one. Um, but I think also there is this element of these are <coughs> ancestral things, mysterious to them, but with some resonance. Uh, and I think that's very definitely what they were doing. There's um, some Orland stone. You see there's a boat on it. Yes. That when you look out there, See, that's quite rare. But that's very rare. We've only, there, there's one other carving of a boat in the caves at Reims and Fife, which is possibly Pictish, early Pictish. It's, it's a lot more, it's, it's very rudimentary. Um, so it, it, it could be earlier or it could just be more like a graffito rather than, than an expert carving. Um, but certainly the one at St. Orleans is. Unique, and if you get if you uh, you get the light on it, and you, you can start to make out, you can tell that it's clinker built. It's actually you can see planks on it, so it's not it's it's not uh, like a skin conical type thing. It's a clinker built boat, um, and uh, I certainly I put I put a little note about it into the Pictish Art Society newsletter a few years ago, just after I recorded it, and got some quite interesting feedback from people because the people that are in the boat, the, the figures that are in the boat, there are different sizes and usually on Pictish sculpture that's a way of defining um, status. So you know if you've got a king and two people escort them, 
the king's usually head and shoulders bigger than the other. And I don't think it's just a representation of the fact that he was tall and the other his bodyguards were short. It's emphasis, it's, it's saying the important guy is big. So there's one person sitting in the prow of the boat who's head and shoulders above all the other people. So whoever it is, um, and again we don't know whether it's a secular thing or whether there's a religious significance, but there are important people and um, uh, with robes on and then lesser people, the oarsmen, are smaller um, and have less detail about them. But it's a fabulous little motif. Quite far the one. Yes, exactly. Well, that's the other thing. And not really close to any big river. I mean, even if, if it was on the side of the Tay or something, you could imagine that being navigable to, to a reasonably sized kind of rowboat like that. Um, but it's, it's really it's a burn that's close to it. It's not a, you couldn't see a boat of it. So, again, see, you have that thing, though, that whatever it's telling, it might not be about what happened here. Whatever story it is, and we've now lost that, and um, it doesn't need to be to have been played out there. So it could be a biblical thing, or it could just be some other. Somebody had a one, one of my friends had a notion that it might be connected with um, one of the saints, Saint Boniface, who sails into the Tay estuary and establishes a church at um, initially at uh, Invergowrie and then moves on around establishing churches and she wondered if it might be some representation but she then backed away from that because there were other bits she couldn't make up and being a very scholarly lady she didn't want to float an idea that had, had, didn't have enough grounding on it but you know it could have been something like that where it's some saint who's travelling around by boat um, and maybe the saint pitches up there but not in the boat my understanding of the storm stone is that it was on the edge of what the walk before the walk was drained. Right. And it was sitting on the high ground uh -huh. at that point. Right. And then that was drained and then the railway went through. So you put it, you mean it then that for the walk actually extended right away? Not, not, not far out, yes. Well, that's, that's, yeah. that'd be an interesting thing then. So that would that would be interesting to, to, to think about if, mm -hmm. um, if, if the water came yeah, an awful yeah. lot closer up to that, then yeah. that would be navigable by a boat. Yeah. 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 Right. 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 Yeah. And a great many of them came out of the fabric of the church when it was being reworked in the 1870s. Thank you. Um, uh, they were remodeling part of it, and uh, the stones had been broken up and used as building stone. And there's still an absolutely fabulous one in there. Um, the uh, squad from the, uh, the abbey came out and removed some mortar and a couple of stones from underneath it. It's on the south wall. And it's a big long and it looks like the shape of a cross slab in section. Um, and they took out a couple of stones and uh, they, we had these <coughs> endoscope cameras that you could put in and shine a wee light out. And it's got, it, it comes out, it's an incumbent stone with a socket lying upside down, so the socket's facing down the way. Um, and on the inside, it is fabulously carved with um, diagonal key pattern. <coughs> so there, there, there will be more in there. I mean, that's the, with all these things, it's you know, legal and envisions quite large assemblages, thirty plus stones in each. But you have to assume to yourself that that is only a fraction of what would have been there, maybe a third of what was there um, over the century when it was at its apex. Um, there were probably um, many, many more, and most of them will either be shattered and lying in the ground or broken up and built into the cottages and the church and, and wherever else. Yeah. Reference to that stone that you mentioned on the south wall, I can remember and Graham, William, some of the people who were, were at the meeting, I was quite excited when the Historic Scotland asked for permission to not only I think expose that stone but perhaps to remove it and the 
this was something that I was, oh, this is going to be wonderful. And uh, it went to the cut session to a vote, and it went 50-50. <laughs> Who would want to see that score? <laughs> Fortunately, the minister had the casting vote, and he voted the right way. <laughs> and fortunately, nothing, well, that's good because nothing much has happened for many, no. many years no. until they were repointing the walls. And, and uh, I don't know if there's any prospect of that stone being removed. I, the, it, I tried my hardest to the, um, the, the, the guy with DHS at the time, Peter Yeoman, who was heavily involved with the <coughs> museum. I tried my darndest to get him to just say, bring the bullet and take the thing out and add it. They had just finished the display, and I think he looked at it and thought, how am I going to shoehorn this in? And that's the last thing I need is another <coughs> two metre long piece of stone to, to get into a tiny museum that's already burst at the seams. And I, I think the, the money involved in doing that and replacing it and, and showing it all up, they decided that we know where it is, we know where it is, it's fine where it is, we'll just leave it. So. Um, I feel quite confident that the cup members would be quite happy for it to be mounted inside the church. Well, that's <laughs> nice to know. When you say that, um, my friends, colleagues with the Pictish Art Society found a fabulous Pictish cross slab. Somebody had actually notified, saw the cross, uh, and had put it into Discovery and Excavation, which is an annual journal of recent of new archaeological discoveries. So, um, a visitation from the Pictish Society went, and it's a big slab, and they carefully flipped it over, and lo and behold, there were symbols on the back. So there and then, six of them, it took six of them to move it, they went and got the key for the church and carried it into the church, and they got a couple of wooden buttons, and they laid it in the church, and for the best part of 20-something years, we tried to get the Kirk session to agree to get it erected inside the church at our cost. <coughs> you wouldn't let us. They wouldn't let us. Um, there is, with some people, I think there is a suspicion of pagan with the symbols, and it was just they thought this was a bad thing. And you, I, I, I gave a presentation one evening to the, um, uh, to, to the congregation and said, you know, this is a Christian monument, there's a cross over the front of it, and it represents probably the earliest Christian church. Here at Mogi Rate, it's, it's the, the, it's the coming of Christianity to this part of the glen, and um, you know, uh, but they would not, they would not bow to it. So it's still lying on two wooden buttons, and if you want to go and see it, you have to go with four people so that you can look at the bit of something and then thumb it over. <laughs> <laughs> and the next person gets to sign the new left up, and that's the people before hoping they can flip the back. Um, Look, look at it, that's close to where I belong, we'll make a line. Well, I suspect, I suspect the church is now probably on the closure list, because I think the congregation has dwindled. Yeah. So, um, it, it will probably end up in certain museums at some point. Yeah. Oh, lose, lose, it, lose it to the, to the locality, yeah. yeah. That's a big shame. Yeah. Are there any other questions? No. no. I think the, I opened the door to check to see the, 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 the coffee's already and the nice wafting smell of coffee came through, so uh, it's made me anxious to, to move on. Um, I think it's uh, just to say that we, we can stay for the coffee. John has agreed to stay on for some time th th this evening and you know, we chat with him. He's more than happy to chat with people about, the, about the, his work and, uh, uh, and the stones and the likes. Um, it certainly opened my eyes to a, a whole new way of looking at the stones and uh, I can only thank you for, for sharing all that with us, John.